we've been talking about symbol codes or variable length codes, and sometimes people also refer to those as source codes. And we saw these nice little examples of symbol codes. And we noticed that our example C here had a serious deficiency in that for a given sequence of, of uh, code words, we were not able to uniquely determine the sequence of source symbols that generated that sequence of code words. And we referred to this as it being not uniquely decodable. Now let's see if we can come up with a more mathematical definition or characterization of that property. So we would like to be able to characterize codes that are uniquely decodable in the sense that for any given sequence of, of code words, there is a unique sequence of source symbols that generated it. Or another way to say that is that if two sequences of source symbols are different, then they generate different sequences of code words. Different sequences, well, not just different sequences of code words, but different sequences when you look at the actual uh, code symbols, the actual sequence of, say, zeros and ones in this case, that the code words make up, that you can, that they have different sequences. So there is actually a nice mathematical concept for just this thing. And so we can define the property of C being uniquely decodable. So we say that C is uniquely decodable if its extension C star, let me write that clearly, if C star is one to one, that's it. It's if it's one to one, a one to one function. So remember C star was this function it was a function from x star to a star, a function from sequences of source symbols to sequences of code symbols determined by stringing together their, the code words. And so when we say that c star is one to one, we mean that for any, you know, for any, so I could say, i.e., if x1 up to xn is not equal to y1 up to yn, and these are two sequences of source symbols, then that implies, or maybe I should say, then C star X1 to N is not equal to C star Y1 to N. Or I guess this doesn't have to be, uh, I mean, this could be like M or something. Any two sequences are different, right? So that is the definition of a uniquely decodable code. And if it's not clear to you immediately that, 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 that this definition gives us the property that you want, you might want to pause and think about that for a second. So unique decodability is certainly a property that we are going to want in a symbol code. If we're gonna do lossless compression, we need to be able to recover the original sequence of source symbols that we wanted to encode. So, you know, when we're doing lossless compression, we're going to have a sequence of source symbols like, you know, a, you know, A, B, D, D, C, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to send that to some sequence of zeros and ones. And then we would like to recover, you know, we would like to be able to decode the sequence of zeros and ones to recover our original sequence of source symbols. So we certainly need it to be uniquely decodable in order to be able to recover it uh, for any, any given sequence. Now, that said, are there any other properties that we would be desirable? Is that it? You know, uh, just take any uniquely decodable code and then, then voila, we've got, you know, a great code? Well, not necessarily. Certainly there are, there are going to be other things that would be, we would want to consider. And the first of which is, well, we're talking about doing compression. So other desirable properties would be, let's see, desirable properties. The first of which would be, if we're doing compression, we want to have good compression, right? So we want efficiency in the sense of good compression. What else? Well, this is going to be some algorithm that we're going to implement. So we want it to be fast, right? We want it to we want to have good speed in the sense of computational complexity. Fast computation for both encoding and decoding. And a third property, at least of the ones that sort of come to my mind, that we would like 
is simplicity. We would like it to be simple. Something easy to understand and analyze and implement. Now later we'll come back to A and we will think much harder about, about this property of good compression or efficiency. But for the moment, let's think about B and C, and in particular B. So first we said we want it to be fast for encoding. So let's think about you know, encoding. Well, I mean, for these, these little symbol codes, encoding is really not much of an issue. I mean, as long as your source alphabet, as long as your, you know, your, your X here is not too big, I mean, as long as it's finite and it's not too awfully large. I mean, in general, X could be, could be infinite. I should have mentioned that above. Maybe I, I didn't mention that, but, but, you know, here X could be countably infinite. So that would make things a little more difficult but um, not necessarily insurmountable. But as long as X is, is finite and pretty small, then encoding is going to be a simple task. We just take our sequence of symbols like A, A, C, B here. And for the first one, we just look up in some, we have some lookup table of the, the sequence, the, the, the code word for A, and we just write it down. And then we look up the, sequence, the code word for the next guy and we write that down and, and so on. So, so encoding time is, uh, it, it, generally, it's not going to be a major issue, at least, you know, when you have a, a small, finite source alphabet. So what about decoding time? Is there any way that we could characterize codes which are, you know, some simple mathematical characterization of codes which are fast to decode? Well, maybe to start to get some intuition for this, we could look at these two examples, A and B here. C was not uniquely decodable, so let's just forget about that for now. A and B, well, first, are they uniquely decodable? I guess we, you know, we, we said C was not, but we haven't really determined whether these are or not. So we have A and B here. And maybe before we just jump to trying to determine whether they're uniquely decodable and just let's let's maybe just play around with trying to decode a sequence from each of these. So let's do that. Now I have prepared for your convenience a sequence drawn from that code and uh, and I copied the code down here so we could use it for reference. So I took, so I generated this by taking some sequence of source symbols, A, B, C, and D, and I wrote down the corresponding code words and strung them together, but I've since forgotten what it is. So we're gonna figure out what the sequence of source symbols was for this. So let's do that. So we start out, we have a zero. And so we know that there's some sequence of code words that generated this. And the only code word that starts with zero is CA. So we know that the first symbol in the source sequence must have been an A. Now, what do we have? We have a one, so that takes care of this guy. We have a one. So all of these begin with one. It could have been any of those, not this one. And then we have another one and then a zero. So let's see. So it couldn't have been this. It could have, after two, after two ones, it could have been either of these. But then after we see the zero, we see one, one, zero, we know that it had to be C. So this was, this must have come from C. Write that more clearly, C. Now what do we have? We have zero, one, 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 blah, blah, blah. So let's see, zero. Well, that has to be A, right? That must have been A. Now we have one, 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 et cetera. So it couldn't have been that one. So one, 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 let's see, one, one doesn't match with that. One, one, one doesn't match with that. Had to be D, so one, one, one must have been D. Now we have one, zero, one, blah. So let's see, one, one, after one, it could have been any of these, but then after one, zero, we know it had to be B. So let's see, B, then one, zero again, it couldn't have been A, and then after we see the zero, we know that it had to be B. So that was easy. That was pretty quick and simple. We could just sort of, as we traveled along the sequence, just just look at each uh, symbol in turn and narrow down the possibilities. And then we could just write down, as soon as we saw each code word, we could just write down the corresponding source symbol. So that was a instructive case for A. And now let's think about, let's think about B. So let's do a similar example for B. So let's go down here. 
And again, for your viewing convenience, I have prepared a sequence for B and I've copied the code here so we can nice and easily refer to it. So let's start out, let's just do the same thing. So we start here, we have, let's see, one, one, zero. So it is a one, let's see. So that's consistent with A or D. And we have one, one. So uh, that couldn't have been A, so it must have been, so the first one must have been D. Now let's see, now we have one, zero, one. And let's see, it couldn't have been those, uh, we, the first symbol, it could have been consistent. So we're just looking at one, we could have had D. So let's see, so well, let's back up. So one could be consistent with A or D. One zero could be consistent with A, or it could be D, B, or D, C. But now when we look at the third one, let's see, it can't be, it could be A, it could, but it couldn't be D, B, because then the third symbol would be a zero here. And it couldn't be DC because the third symbol would be a zero. So we know that this must have been A. Okay, now we have zero. I'll maybe do one symbol at a time. Zero could be, could be B or C. Then another zero, so zero, zero could be still B or C. Zero, zero, zero. Now it could be C or it could be B, B or it could be B, C. So, okay, now we have to look again. So we have zero, 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 zero. This could be, okay, now C is eliminated, but now we could have either B, B or B, C. Okay, so now we have to keep looking. Zero, 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 zero. What could this be? This could be B, C, or it could be B, B, B. And if we look one more, we see zero, 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 one. That could be B, C, but it, let's see, it could, it, it could be B, B, it can't be B, 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 but what about B, B, no, it can't be B, B, A, it can't be B, B, D. So therefore, so it must have been, finally, we see that this, this must have been B, and this must have been C. Okay, whew. That was some, some logic there. And now we have the last little piece. And what is this? Well, let's see, we have a zero. So that could be B or C. We have zero, zero, that could be B or C still. Zero, zero, one, that could not be C. So it must have been B, either A or D, but we know it ends now, so it must have been B, D. So this would must have been B and this must have been D. All right, so we, we, we got it, we managed to do it, so it, it was, it was, at least on this little example, this was uniquely decodable. I mean, that doesn't necessarily imply that the whole code is uniquely decodable, but this little example was. But it took us quite a bit more, at least I think for me, at least going mentally going through, this was quite a bit more difficult than this first one. And uh, so, you know, at least sort of heuristically on this example, it looks like code B is going to take longer to decode in general than, than A. So can we describe a little, you know, why, why was A easier than B? Well, if you think about what was going on here in B, we had to look ahead. You know, even after we had read 0, 0, we couldn't determine whether B was the symbol yet. We had to read all the way four symbols into the future, four symbols ahead, before we could figure out that this had to have been B. So that was, whereas, whereas with, with A, with our, at least in this example, we were able to immediately, after, upon reading any given, you know, sequence, like when we got to one, one, zero here, we were able to just immediately say, ah, that must have been C. So that was a property that, that this code had, at least in this example, and this code did not. And so it turns out, I'll, I'll, I'll clue you in, I'll jump to the, jump to the, to the chase and tell you that in fact, both of these codes are uniquely decodable. You might have been able to sort of see why for this one. For this one, it's a bit more subtle to see why this is in fact uniquely decodable in general, but I'll leave that as an exercise for you to prove. That would be a nice little exercise for you to take as a proof. Can, can you prove that B is in fact a uniquely decodable code? So that's an exercise, exercise. B is uniquely decodable. 
and and A is also uniquely decodable. And in fact, A is what's called a prefix code. A is a prefix code. And next, in the next video, we'll define what that means, what a prefix code is, or it's also called prefix free or instantaneous. And that property is just what we observed as we were decoding this little example, that as soon as we, we finished reading a given code word, we were able to immediately decode it. We were able to, upon the completion of reading any given code word, we were able to just instantaneously determine what the, 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 the symbol that had generated the sequence up to that point. All right, and that, that's called the, the prefix property for reasons that will become clear in the definition. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that next.